long story short, I have a small garden, but a lot of stuff is planted in there. And this past spring, I planted about 30 or 40 super rare fruit trees that were pretty small, less than a one gallon size all over the yard. And for six months, they lived stress-free. Nothing was messing with them at all. Well, that changed in the matter of one night. It was getting warm and raccoons often go for water sources. And they also get hungrier when it's warmer. So I walk out to my garden one day and everything is dug up. Everything that is small enough for those little raccoon paws to go and get into has been taken out of the ground. And that is because raccoons are in search of worms or grubs. So they're not really meaning to do harm. It's by them simply looking for food that they do things that as a gardener can be devastating. Because I lost some really rare seedlings that I cannot find the seeds for to grow out again. So I'm just SOL on that. And these mofos are so cute. If you're looking for a video that's to cause harm to these, that's not this video. We're gonna talk about deterrence and what I did to get these guys to stop digging so much. So that was problem number one. They dug up my garden and all the new seedlings. Number two, I have a lot of potted plants everywhere. And because I have drip emitters in each of the pots, it makes the soil right under the pot moist, which is a great place for earthworms. So they started to dig right under the pots and that would turn the pot over and the drip emitter would fall out. So that would mean that out of 100 pots, I'm looking daily and I miss a few. Well, those have had the emitter pulled out of them by accident because as they're rummaging around the pots, the emitter popped out and so it doesn't get watered for like a week. I'm like, by the time I find it, the plant's near death. And I lost a very rare Jabotacaba because of that. And I've lost, or almost lost, five other super rare plants that are in pots simply because their irrigation was pulled out. So that was factor number two. I was at my wit's end losing all of these rare plants because some of these are so rare you get one chance to get them and it's not going to be another time coming your way. So the third thing put me over the edge. So I had some fruit trees in which I decided to graft this year. So I got some scions to graft onto those trees and grow them out. Well, the raccoons were crawling up those trees and the sheer just size and weight of those cute mofos, if they would hit the graft part, it would just break the scion right off and graft ruin. Um, because what happened was I didn't find them on the ground until about four or five days later. At that time, they've dried out. There's nothing I can do. They were just not going to come back and that happened to a pretty good selection of java plum that I had uh, and there's nothing I can do to get those back so just really really sad so those three things said oh my god I have got to do something about this problem and so I did and now I have been raccoon free in the important areas of my yard for one month so let's go over the three things that I did that helped deter raccoons from digging up my plants, turning over my pots, and breaking some of the grass. Raccoons are very smart animals, and they would rather do their business in the undercover darkness and not have anything disturb them. And they would rather just eat and run than stick around. So the first method we thought about doing was getting a motion detection water spraying system. I'll make sure to include all the links to all these things in the description. When we opened the box, it was just pretty simple items included in there. There was the motion detection, the kind of valve, the spike you put in the ground, and the sprayer. We're not exactly the best at reading instructions, so we thought it looked simple enough. We just put everything together, and that's when we went outside. We hooked it up to this Rainbird timer. It comes on for six hours a night, so about 10 or 11. We'll change it up a little bit. It'll start and run for six hours. So what that means is via the, the tea that we have there, water will fill up this flexible hose. 
and it leads itself to this. And we've been moving this everywhere around the yard. Now to me personally, the most fun of this method one was the trial and error of trying to get it to spray exactly where you wanted it to spray and to do the motion detection because it was not working as planned at the beginning. There's some sensitivity levels you have to put it, uh, you know, spray it <laughs> in a specific direction. And as you can see, it was not being that uh, cooperative. So you just keep trying, you get just keep trying, have fun getting wet. It's spraying everywhere except where it needs to spray. And then eventually you get there. So it only took us about 15, 20 minutes. But then eventually we got it and we tested it and it works like a charm. Method number two is using some of nature at uh, your disposal to naturally do what it does best. This is K apple, for example. And look at the thorns on this guy. It's actually used in Africa to help form hedges that keep lions and other animals out of certain areas. So principle is you're looking for thorny plants. Even over here, I have finger lime. It's an unassuming plant, right? Except that when you take a really close look, there are thorns everywhere that run along a finger lime. So you're going to see what plants you have growing in your yard that you can use for this. This, I would say, is so painful when you touch it, you just don't. Raccoons are gonna feel the same way. If you're saying to yourself, hey, I don't grow anything that has tons of thorns, what do I do? Well, ask around on some of the neighborhood groups. I put a call out to some of my friends and the neighborhood groups and I said, do you guys grow anything with thorns that I could use for a little experiment? And lo and behold, I got almost three and a half or four half wine barrels dumped in a location that uh, I was able to go and then this is all I have left because I've used them all. But look at this citrus. <laughs> it's actually beautiful bark. But wow, yeah, the thorns on this, not going to be fun for digging. Our front yard area has no protection with the water spraying or what we're gonna do for method number three. So what I did was take all of my thorny stuff and cut it into pieces that I then laid around the areas they were digging in. As you can tell, I got to this area late, but they were digging in all of these new cherimoya and atomoya and rare anona areas. So, around each of the spots, are thorny things. So they're trying to go where the water is because that's where the grubs and the earthworms are. So when they go to dig, they're going to get hit by finger lime and K-apple and all this other stuff. And they're not going to do it more than once, I guarantee you. They hit those, they stop, guaranteed. So I did it all along my front yard. When we are in my backyard, I have a lot of area to cover. So I have also put these around all of my pots or areas that didn't have any other protection. So here's an Anona planting that I have over here. Can't really even see anything, right? Until you get close. And then there is finger lime everywhere. I mean, if I touch these, they are going to make my fingers burn for a long, long time. So this is one month raccoon free. I want to remind everyone, they used to come out here and everything was dug up because this is a moist shaded area and they found good grubs here. Not any longer. And see back here along all of my pots, I have put you know, it's not that many. I just put what I could spare back there. 
and along all of my rose pots. I put it in the front of all the pots and in the back of all the pots if I could and sometimes in between the pots. And this has made the world of difference. So all of these rare Jabota Kabas have been in the background along with these rare Anonas that are in the pots. And like, do I have an example? One of these almost died because it was not watered, but somewhere in there. One of them lost all of its leaves. Here's an example. This one was dying because it didn't get watered for a long, long time because they got the emitter out. But I've, I've done this and it has recovered some. So that has been useful, useful, useful. So method two, thorny things wherever they dig. And I guarantee you, when they hit these areas, they're not going to dig <laughs> again. They hate it. Another method is getting an electric fence for larger areas in your yard. I never thought I would actually do this, but I did. I got this all-in-one unit. You can find it in the link below, and it was super easy to set up. It's just basically the solar panel, the battery, and then additionally, we ordered some fencing post and some electric wire. With all that together, it was very, very quick to set all this up. We had to go and install the solar panel on the post, and then we put all of the stakes in the ground where we wanted the wire. And then finally, round and round, we went with all of the actual wire to all the different places that the raccoons were digging. I wouldn't say this is my favorite method, but it is one of the most effective. This electric fencing setup is messier than I would like, but it is effective. So I am gonna keep using it, and it has been a game changer, especially in the areas that were so big that I either couldn't use enough thorny plants uh, so that they wouldn't dig, or that I needed to get into daily, because this I can just step over and get into my plantings and do anything that I need to, whether it's fertilize or weed or whatever. So we'll walk through it, and I'll show you how it's set up but it is a little bit of a game changer. I may figure out a way to make it look nicer, but for now, this, this is something that if you're having problems with raccoons and you don't mind installing a fence, uh, man, it makes a big difference. We installed the all-in-one panel, because remember it's the panel and the battery all-in-one. Uh, we installed it in the sunniest spot that we could think of. We got a T-bar from a big, a box store and it just sat right into the back or we could have put it on this 4x4 actually that's why I put these screws so when it's winter time and it doesn't get quite as much sun down there we'll move it up here maybe what I do like about this electric fence is that there is a night mode so you can see there it's auto off and night so on night mode, that's what we normally leave it on so that this is basically going to be active during the night and then during the daytime, it will not shock us. If I turn it on right now, like for example, auto, I don't know if you can see the light blinking there, but you also hear a tapping. That means the voltage is going through the wire. So if something were to touch it now, ouch, that's off. And that just means that it's on night mode and it would not touch you unless it detects that it is dark enough to. That's when the raccoons come out. But super easy to attach. You have a red and a black wire denoting live and grounded. So the live goes to your string. And then the black goes to a copper rod that we have put into the ground. So the way an electric fence works is it creates a current and the copper rod is going to be basically conducting the like or closing the circuit. So if an animal is touching the ground and the copper rod is in place, well when they touch this then the current will go through them. 
So it was very confusing the way this worked until I read up on it. I would suggest going and reading up on electric fences if they confuse you, but man, was this easy to set up and you can do it. We pushed this rod into the ground uh, ourselves. We just pushed it as far as we could go. Then we used a rubber mallet to put it in. The It's a four foot rod and it was really cheap and it's about foot and a half above the ground, maybe two feet. So at least two feet in the ground because you want, you want good contact uh, in the soil. And then here are the rods or the fence holders, fence post holders that we bought from Amazon. And what I don't like about them is they don't have a very good footing. Like the ones we use on a farm we're trying to start have a much longer footing. So when you put them into the ground, they're sturdy, but you know, for a home garden, these get the job done. And then we just have spaced them pretty far apart. If you need really good spacing, I would say about every two feet, but we went about every eight feet because we didn't want to waste that much money on these. And we just did what we had to do. So they start at the electric, uh, you know, at the, mo at the box and then goes down and the live wire simply touches wherever the string is that you want to start. So we did a big square around this first area, right? So you'll see, here's another post, here's this. Right now I'm showing you the bad things. If there are lots of plants that are touching your wire, try and get them off. It makes it a little less effective. So if you have a few plants on it, not going to be a big deal, but the more plants that grow on this, the more the charge is going to dissipate as it goes down the wire. So you want to get as much off as you can. So I have a walkway between my two areas. So every morning I trip on this, but it's part of the deal. So you have to connect the areas. So I have another square of electric fencing surrounding this area and you have to make sure that they connect. So what I did is I cut this one and I did it. And then I cut another one for this and you tie it together. And that's all you have to do with tying them together. As long as these metal pieces that are in between the two sections of string touch somewhere, you're going to get the current flowing. So basically see how I wrapped it before I tied off the knot. I am getting connection from the wires somewhere because there's enough exposed there where they're going to touch each other and continue the current over there. So that's how this section was done. Digging stopped. And so I had to do one more area. So I did hate doing this. This is extended over here to this area, which they were really, really, really digging in and killed a lot of stuff. And they were also climbing up this Java plum. So I also did the electric fence up to this part of the Java plum. Just note that with electric fences, the animals still have to be on the ground. So the raccoons were coming and they were going up. So this prevents them from going up. If they're on another tree and they come over and then they start going down, they will not get shocked until they touch the ground. So that's why these are ineffective when it comes to rats and squirrels. So we ended up using all three methods in conjunction with each other all around the yard. So you have electric fencing, you have thorns, you have the water sprayer that we move about every two weeks so the raccoons don't remember where it is all the time. And it gets them in new spots. The electric fence is over here. I even have some of the finger lines and sharp things going on within the area in case I ever forget to turn the electric fence on. There's some more stuff. The water thing is here. For a long time, it was over in this area. And next it's gonna move over here so that they get this area so it's going to always be changing and through that we've gotten very very good protection about a month's worth of no plants being killed now where those three methods are not in place you will probably still get some digging but they're 
animals, they need food. So I let them go into the other parts of the yard where they can be destructive. And all it is is like me cleaning up some areas or I don't care. I mean, these are living creatures. I want them to have a good life, just not where I am gardening rare plants. Ugh. Now, if I can come up with a way to make all three of these methods a little bit more attractive, that'll be a game changer, but it's getting uh, everything done. So if you like these tips, don't forget to like and follow. It really helps a small channel like me out. And uh, join me next time.